If it were true that the history of the West were the history of men oppressing women, we would expect to find some significant evidence of such oppression in the literature that privileged men wrote. We would expect that some of the most culturally influential men of their time would at least occasionally reveal their contempt for women and their pleasure in controlling them. I'm Janice Fiamingo, and this is the Fiamingo File 2.0. But rather than entitlement, violence, or indifference, what we encounter is a massive body of love poetry, stretching back through the centuries in which extended adoration of the woman and expressions of dedicated or hopeless yearning form a major component, and in which the commission of violence is presented as the height of mental malady, as in Robert Browning's sinister dramatic monologue, My Last Duchess. At the height of the English love poetry tradition in the 16th and 17th centuries, the time of William Shakespeare, Sir Philip Sidney, Edmund Spencer, and John Donne, to name only the most illustrious, there were literally thousands of love poems written in which the sexual and emotional power of the female and the delirious joy, racking self-doubt or passionate yearning of the male are the central subject. If such had been written by women about men, we wouldn't kid ourselves about their meaning. Here we have one sex focused with amorous intensity on the other, men obsessed with pleasing, winning, and paying homage to women. There is no comparable body of love poetry by women about men, despite the fact that since at least the early 19th century, Women have been active as poets in English. There are individual love poems or sequences. One thinks, for example, of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Sonnets from the Portuguese, which includes her famous poem, How Do I Love Thee? But there is no established convention of female expressions of obsessive love for men's bodies or minds. Men's love poems run the gamut from joy in wedded bliss to exasperation at the indifference or cruelty of the beloved, dwelling on the frustrated desire of the spurned lover or the satisfied desire of the happy one. Sexual entitlement, coercion of the woman, or indiscriminate lust are rare to non-existent. In John Donne's magnificent love lyric, The Sun Rising, published after his death in 1633, the speaker of the poem is so unwilling to get out of the bed he shares with his beloved that he castigates the sun for its rudeness in shining in on them through the window, commanding the sun in mock exasperation to go elsewhere and finally conceding that it makes sense for the sun to focus on his beloved and him since the center of the universe is in the lover's bed. She's all states, all prince's eye. Nothing else is. Given this realization, the speaker ends in grudging yet exultant submission to the sun's mandate. Quote, Since thy duties be to warm the world... That's done in warming us. Shine here to us, and thou art everywhere. This bed thy center is, these walls thy sphere. End quote. The dramatic exaggerations of language and mood throughout the poem are a joyful declaration of the effect of love on the speaker. In Thomas Wyatt's mid 16th century sonnet, Who So List to Hunt? The speaker's mood is the exact opposite. He is despondent. Having been fruitlessly pursuing a woman for a long time with no happy ending in sight, not only is he making no progress, but he is losing ground. And others, likely to be no more successful, are running after the same woman. The voice that speaks in this poem is humiliated and full of self-disgust, but unable to give up on the woman. Whenever he tries to leave off, he finds himself wanting her all over again. Quote, 
Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, but as she fleeth afore, fainting I follow. End quote. The poem is structured around the extended metaphor of a pointless hunt with the woman compared to a deer who won't be caught, leading feminist critics to moralize about male dehumanization of women and sexual violence. But it's clear from the poem that the man has no power to compel the woman or even to touch her. Though he is the hunter, he's the one helplessly caught. Many of the sonnet series around this time are about untouchable women. One of the greatest English poets of the late 16th century, Sir Philip Sidney, wrote a sonnet sequence dated to 1582 entitled Astrophil and Stella, comprising 108 sonnets, in which the inaccessibility and coldness of the woman and the hopelessness of the poet's efforts are already indicated in the title. Astrophil combines the Greek words for star and lover and includes a shortened version of the poet's name, Philip, Phil, while Stella is the Latin word for star. Astrophil loves Stella, but she is as distant as a star, and all he can do is imagine ways to provoke her pitying interest in his anguish. Quote, that the dear she might take some pleasure of my pain, pleasure might cause her read, reading might make her know, knowledge might pity win and pity grace obtain, end quote. The series of mites in the lines emphasize his despair. And the collection of poems ruminates in general on the intensity of unrequited love and the connection between desire and poetic creativity. In contrast, Sidney's poetic rival, Edmund Spencer, wrote a series of poems, about 90 sonnets, called the Amoretti, published in 1595, to describe Spencer's real-life courtship and marriage in 1594 to Elizabeth Boyle. In the final poem in the series, the Epithalamian, it's a poem in honor of a bride, he lavishly praises his wife's physical loveliness, itemizing, quote, her goodly eyes like sapphires shining bright, her forehead ivory white, her cheeks like apples which the sun hath rutted, her lips like cherries charming men to bite, and on and on in that manner, but paying ultimate tribute to her, quote, inward beauty, which includes her, quote, sweet love and constant chastity, end quote. Such poems praising the beloved often included formulaic descriptions of the woman's attractiveness and or declare that her beauty of character outweighs all. The tradition of idealized comparisons became so familiar that by the late 16th century it could be mocked. Shakespeare's sonnet 130, which begins famously, My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun, plays on the many comparisons that besotted poets tended to make to celebrate a woman's beauty. Shakespeare's poem admits that his beloved's hair is more like dark wire than like spun gold, that her breath isn't always sweet, and her breasts are dun-colored rather than snowy white, but insists that he loves and desires her anyway, as the final couplet states, and yet by heaven I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. The speaker's tone is fervent and full of admiration for his human goddess. And what of the women in these poems, the subjects of so much close contemplation, wonder, and exasperated longing? Are they merely objects, disempowered, passive, voiceless? That's certainly what the feminist critics allege, and almost no literary analysis today escapes an overlay of feminist condemnation or skepticism about male love poetry. But the feminists are wrong. The beloved is often implicitly present in these poems. We not only see her beauty and learn of her actions, but sometimes actually hear her voice in the poem, talking back to the poet, responding to him, intellectually sparring with him or teasing him. 
For example, the beloved in Edmund Spencer's 1595 Sonnet 75 is directly quoted in the poem chiding the poet, uh, chiding him for imagining that he can defeat death and time with his pen. She mocks him as a, quote, vain man that dost in vain assay a mortal thing so to immortalize, end quote. In other words, she's saying it's foolish for him to try to make her immortal. But the speaker persists in an elaborate compliment both to himself as a writer and to her, promising her that, quote, my verse, your virtues rare, shall eternize, and in the heavens write your glorious name." End quote. And 400 plus years later, we do still know her name, and we know that she was Elizabeth Boyle, the much-admired second wife of Spencer. John Donne's tour de force lyric poem, The Flea, in my opinion, the wittiest and most exuberant love poem ever written, also dramatically brings to life the woman it is addressing. The poem is about a flea that the poet sees on the arm of his beloved, which having just sucked his blood, he imagines as a sacrament that is mingling his blood with hers in a kind of miniature marriage ceremony. They might as well consummate the marriage, he suggests erotically, since it has already, in a sense, been consummated. He says to her, look at the flea. Mark but this flea, and mark in this how little that which thou deniest me is. It sucked me first, and now sucks thee, and in this flea our two bloods mingled be. Thou knowest that this cannot be said a sin, nor shame, nor loss of maidenhead, yet this enjoys before it woo, and pampered swells with one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. In response to her persistent lover, the beloved is vibrantly present in the poem, responding to the speaker, disobeying him, entering into the courtship joke, co-writing the poem, as it were. Between the second and third stanzas, she impishly crushes the flea, as he's been begging her not to do. And the poem then thus dramatically brings to life not only the desire of the speaker for the woman, but also her self-confident sexual and emotional power. Feminist critics have analyzed such poetry extensively in order to tell us that what we are reading with our own eyes is not what's really there, and that these expressions of love and desire are Nothing more than patriarchal objectification in which the woman is reduced to a thing, you know, to be owned, possessed, exploited. But even in the simplest expressions of the tradition, such an argument is very difficult to maintain. Thomas Campion's 1617 sonnet, There is a Garden in Her Face, is typical of the convention of the extended, idealized comparison in which individual features of the woman's face are compared to beautiful objects in nature, such as flowers, fruits, and precious gems. In this case, we have roses and white lilies used to describe her complexion, cherries, and at other times, rosebuds as similes for her lips and her teeth as orient pearls, so on. These comparisons, which are at once innocent and erotic, are intended to evoke the sensual attractiveness of the beloved's face and the deep admiration of a lover who can see no flaw in her. Now here's the middle stanza of the three stanza poem. Those cherries fairly do enclose of orient pearl a double row which when her lovely laughter shows, they look like rosebuds filled with snow, yet them nor peer nor prince can buy, till cherry ripe themselves do cry. Cherry ripe, in the repeated refrain of the stanza's final line, is what fruit sellers would call to advertise their wares. So the poem is emphasizing that no one can possess the woman against her will. She cannot be kissed until she is ready. So the beautiful sounds and images of the poem, combined with this emphasis on the woman's choice, showcase her power 
to inspire. Now, poems like Campion's, which were produced, as I've said earlier, in the thousands during the English Renaissance, can be seen as acts of objectification only if one understands objectification to actually mean a form of sacralization in which the poet pays tribute to the woman's physical and moral self as precious enough to inspire his most exalted feats of poetic creation. There is nothing demeaning in it. It's quite the contrary. This tradition of the lover aflame with passion is part of a popular convention that didn't necessarily express the literal reality of the writer's lives, but it is impossible to believe that the style of writing would have had the enduring appeal it did if it didn't correspond to the heart experience of generations of men and women. In this tradition, loving deeply and sometimes suffering the pangs of unrequited love were an honorable part of male experience and women were clearly considered worth suffering for. Now, many more examples could be given, but those of the most esteemed names in Renaissance poetry should be adequate to make the case. Let me end with a 20th century example, a poem published in 1931 by the famous American poet E. E. Cummings, who updated the tradition of the love sonnet while keeping many of its essential features. In this poem titled Somewhere I Have Never Traveled, Gladly Beyond, Cummings employed paradoxical phrases to evoke his speaker's disorientation and wonder, turning to new uses the highly conventional imagery of flowers and unknown territory. In the final line of the poem, the power of rain to nurture a garden pales in importance to the small hands of the beloved whose touch produces an emotion the speaker cannot fully explain. In using the image of the rose to describe himself rather than the beloved, the poet freshens the traditional emphasis of this form while acknowledging the deep tenderness that has always been a part of this centuries-old male tradition. So here it is. Somewhere I have never traveled, gladly beyond any experience, your eyes have their silence. In your most frail gesture are things which enclose me or which I cannot touch because they are too near. Your slightest look easily will unclose me, though I have closed myself as fingers. You open always, petal by petal, myself as spring opens, touching skillfully, mysteriously, her first rose. Or if your wish be to close me, I and my life will shut very beautifully, suddenly, as when the heart of this flower imagines the snow carefully everywhere descending. Nothing which we are to perceive in this world equals the power of your intense fragility, whose texture compels me with the color of its countries, rendering death and forever with each breathing. I do not know what it is about you that closes and opens Only something in me understands the voice of your eyes is deeper than all roses. Nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands.